this, this, this choir, y'all killing me. Trust me, y'all, y'all taking me in. I was trying to figure out how long I had to stay in the back because I wanted to come out here and get some of what y'all were doing. It was just powerful. Your leadership is so innovative. What a tremendous pastor you have. Tremendous pastor. Ain't nobody like him. When I grow up, I want to be just like him. Y'all, he's short and statured, but tall in wisdom. Mm. And whenever you find a man of God who loves the people of God like he does, he's a shepherd. I feel like changing my sermon right now. <laughs> In John chapter 5, if you will, start with me at verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. I'm reading from the ESV version. Verse 2, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. In these laid a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want me to be healed or do you want to be healed rather? Sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, took up his bed and started walking. I want to talk about celebration and commission. Celebration and commission. You might be seated in the presence of Almighty God. Celebration and commission. God bless you. Um, I heard Pastor talking about a young lady who had a CD that's out. Where are you, precious? Where are you? Is she behind me? Good. Make sure I get my copies before you, I leave today. I don't want him. I told you I want to be just like him when I grow up. I don't want him to be listening to some stuff that I'm not privy to. So I want to, it, it might inspire me too. So I don't, I want to be just like him. Celebration and commission. It is strange and peculiar to me that Jesus goes to Jerusalem for an undisclosed feast and either while participating in the feast or pulled to the side just before participating, Jesus makes the decision to go to the pool in Jerusalem, which was called Bethesda. For whatever reason, Jesus has gone to the feast and instead of staying where there is celebration, he is drawn instead to the suffering that gathers around a pool in a place called the house of mercy. We're told that at this pool lay sick and infirmed people, people who have been taken to this pool house, have been there for years just so they could get healed. These particular persons are there waiting for the bubbling of the water that would take place only once a year. Let the church say once a year. And they believe that the bubbling water somehow had miraculous power. Especially when at certain times there could not be calculated, an angel would descend to stir the heated water, providing an opportunity for one 
fortunate individual to get into the pool first and that person would be healed while leaving all the others to suffer until the next time. Jesus goes to Jerusalem to celebrate but is drawn instead to the suffering that's right next to the celebration. Please stay with me. Jesus stops festival focused and goes over to his pool, goes over to this pool where suffering people are positioned and he start doing what he was commissioned to do. He sees a man who has been there for 38 years and he walks up on him and he asks him a question that he will remember for the rest of his life. Here's the question. Bruh, do you want to be made whole? Y'all, this is a question that he could have never been asked if Jesus had not decided to ask him in the field, especially since he could not seek to have that question asked in the celebration of the festival, which means for this man that he was right there next to a celebration of might, strength, and power, and the ability of God, but that question never made its way from the celebration over to the pool for 38 years. He was right there next to the power to give him what he needed, but he missed out. 38 years, he's done this. This question never left the celebration, never traveled to Bethesda where there were suffering people laying, listening to the festival sounds right next to them. This undisclosed feast, no doubt, is a gathering of grateful Jews to honor God for some historical moment historical which God demonstrated in a powerful and miraculous way his power to promote and protect and progress his people they're there celebrating that and while they're there celebrating Jesus goes to Jerusalem to go up to the feast but he ends up over at the pool now y'all smarter than me so let me just ask this question how do you end up over by the pool that's full of suffering when you intended to go to the feast. How do you end up, how do you end up, y'all, over at the pool of um, disability when you intended to go to the party? Y'all, instead of celebration at the feast, he's over at the pool working on those he has been commissioned to minister to. I wonder, y'all, if Jesus is trying to get us to see the need for the healthy coexistence between celebration and commission work that he has assigned unto us as a church body. I wonder if Jesus is trying to illustrate for us the tension that exists between wanting to celebrate the goodness of God on one hand and extending to God's goodness to infirmed and needy people on the other hand. The celebration was important or otherwise Jesus would not have gone to it. But the commission was urgent and Jesus felt Pulled to it. My God. Jesus did not ignore the work just because he was going to participate in the celebration. And he didn't let the celebration keep him from doing the work in the field. Y'all, it's certain that those who believe that the focus of one's life should be on celebration would have a lot to say about the actions of Jesus in this text. Because in their minds, Jesus is ignoring the significance of worship and celebration. His walking away from the celebration of the feast would be a red flag for them. 
On the other hand, there are those who defend the need for being in the field working. They would have a problem with Jesus also because in their minds, the work in the field was not his original destination. Now, I, wanna ask, I want you to, to, to let me ask you a couple of questions if you don't mind. I need to ask you, what makes the church more of a church? Is it its festival celebration or its work in the field? I'll wait for your answer. I mean, yo, what makes the church more of a church? Is it its festival celebrations or the work in the field? Okay, let me give you question number two. What defines us as strong Christians? Is it the expression of our faith or the extension of our faith in acts of service and ministry to other people? Mm. Mm. Wow. Okay, let me do this one. You didn't like the first two. Let me see if you like this one. Are you more holy because you praise and worship in the temple? Or is your holiness displayed in your outreach and evangelism in the marketplace? Y'all ain't going to like me, but I came to help you today. I just, um, uh, let, let, let me ask you this one. Okay, all right. Are you closer to God because you focus on celebrating in his honor? Or are you closer to God because you focus on offering field work in his name? I want to suggest y'all there's tension in trying to answer these questions and it's not easily resolved by simply stating what your individual preference might be. This tension exists for Jesus as he walked the tightrope trying to balance his loyalty to the temple and the kingdom crashing in of God's reign here on earth. The Apostle Paul would also have to deal with this as he was attempting to take the gospel from its festival centrality among the Jews and scatter it in the field of the Gentiles' existence. And the tension is also before us as we start celebrating 66 years of worship and witness. And the question I raise is how are we managing the tension? Is friendship? I want to suggest to us that the same tension that was raised then is the same tension raised now. Y'all, is, is there to be a relationship between the festival celebration and field ministry labor? If it is, what's our role in that? Is there to be a relationship between the festival celebration and the field ministry? Is there to be a connection between gathering for worship and searching for opportunities to work in the marketplace? Unfortunately, y'all, many new converts have seen so little field work that they actually believe that spirituality is only about celebration and never about work. Y'all, we're too busy praying about what we want God to do over at the pool rather than taking from our celebration and going over to the pool myself and let God use me to do some work. Y'all ain't going to help me, but I'm coming for you. Jesus models for us that God draws us to the pool. He draws us to the feast so that he can send us to the field. Y'all missed it. I say he draws us to the celebration so he can send us out to the field. See, Jesus models for us that God draws us to the celebration so he can send us to do what he has commissioned us to do. See, I do think that the church has become very responsive to the call to gather for celebration. And that much care and concern has been placed on festival preparation festival performance stage props and what we hope to emote from the attended audience that gathers 
At the same time, there seems to be a strange anemia of kingdom presence in the field where the infirmity is gripping and imprisoning the lives of far too many people. Listen, y'all, whatever your address is, I promise you that right in your block, you're going to find Bethesda. There are some hurting people right around you and it's not enough for you to just enjoy gathering for the celebration and you're not going to do any work in the field. I often wonder, y'all, if the decline in America church, as stated by the statisticians like um, George Bonner, who has done extensive research on the church, I wonder if the decline in church membership in America might be connected in some way to the unwanted diagnosis, overdose on celebration, anemia in field work. Could it be? That nobody is taking the celebration to the field. I wonder if we look at places like Ferguson, Ohio, Los Angeles, Florida, New York, Texas, Baltimore, and even Washington, D.C. Have all become boiling pots of racial profiling and the misuse of law and racial intolerance resulting in too far too many African Americans being murdered even by our own police officers but also by our own people I mean y'all right in this neighborhood 35 year old gun down Yo, what, what's going on could it be all, could it be because the church has become good at celebrating but has been anemic at doing field work I mean, I, yo, yo, could, could it be that we are just anemic and doing field work? We are good in shouting, but we can't be found on the front line. Yo, we're good to shout on Sunday. Then we ought to be ready. To, if, we, if we can shout on Sunday, we ought to be ready to do some work on Monday. Yo, we've spent years getting celebration things perfected. We learned how, how to shout. You know even how to, you even have to teach a visitor how to look spiritual. And while we are in here, y'all, we, 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 we have a healthy coexistence between celebration. We, we know how to do all the stuff that needs to be done. We know just how to look holy. Look at you right now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And when you walk out of here, I can't get you to speak to the bum or the guy on the corner. Listen, y'all, the text is challenging us not to be at the celebration if we're going to ignore what's happening at the pool. I feel like dropping the mic right there. I said, yo, the text is trying to challenge us that we ought not be coming to the celebration and having a good time if we're not going to go over to the pool. Yo, make no mistake about it. God has been good. And regardless of who you are, regardless of what you're managing, regardless of how strong your enemies are, y'all, let, let me help you. Regardless of what you're juggling, regardless of how dark your night might be, God has been good to you. I wait for you, you know, you know for on, the, on the eve of Thanksgiving. I said, God's been good to you. I, I know you're going through some stuff, but y'all, we ought to pause for a moment and give God some praise because God's been good to you. God's been good to you. Don't, don't, act, don't act like God ain't done something for you. I'm looking at you right now. You know God's been good to you. Brought you a mighty long way. God's been good to you. But over at the pool, people need to experience the goodness that we are celebrating. Y'all, this church can't be gathered in strength and then commissioned in field work in weakness. Those of us who are gathered in the church are to take the announcement oh God, about the goodness of God to the field. So that somebody in the field can be transformed and changed. Y'all, we ought to take the announcement of the goodness of God from celebration over to the pool and ask somebody, do you want to be made whole? 
Listen, being mature in the kingdom of God is finding spiritual balance between celebration and commission. Uh, Pastor, let me know when my time is up. I'm going just, to just go. Listen, yo, I want to lift three things regarding our text. Three things real quickly and I'll get up out of here. Number one, Jesus doesn't ever want festival gathering to exempt us from field work. I'll do that again for you. I say he never wants festival gathering to exempt us from feel work. Please take down the notes. Y'all get it. Hold on to it on the 66 years of your celebration. Jesus never wanted festival gathering to exempt us from feel work. He goes up to the celebration and then he goes over to the pool. While at the celebration is taking place, Jesus is in Bethesda working. Allow me to insert parenthetically. If you ever want to know when worship has gone on too long, if you ever want to know, if you ever want to know, if you ever want to know when someone should have given the benediction, if you ever want to know if what you are doing is no longer where God wants you to do what you're doing, let me give you a clue. When Jesus ain't there, it's over. Maybe what the text should have said was that those at the feast, when they discovered that Jesus wasn't there, and that he was over at the pool, then the celebration should have stopped right then. Songs should have become silent. Dancers should have stopped dancing. Prayer should have been halted. Keyboard should have been unplugged. Sound man should have shut down the sound. Light should have started flashing. Usher should have pointed people out the door. And someone ought to have asked, what are we in here for celebrating if Jesus is out there doing work? Because if Jesus isn't here, then there isn't anything for us to celebrate. Y'all ain't going to help me preach, but I come to preach anyhow. Y'all, somebody needs to know that you should know that Jesus is over at the pool. So, so, so where, is, where is church? Over at the pool. <laughs> Y'all ain't helping me. It's over at the pool. That's where church ought to be. Over at the pool. Where should we be? Over at the pool. That was one half of y'all. I'm going to try it one more time. Where should we be? Over at the pool. Because if you are where Jesus isn't, then you are where you should not be. If everybody at the celebration had followed Jesus over to the pool, if everyone had followed him over to the pool, I wondered, uh, Dr. Maxwell, I wonder how, how, many, how, many, how many folk could have gotten saved that day? <sighs> the question that was asked to one man could have been asked of every person, especially since we know that there were more people at the celebration than there were at the pool. Somebody at the celebration should have gone to the pool, watched Jesus minister to the man who had been stuck on his mat for 38 years, and then identify somebody that they could approach and just duplicate what they saw Jesus do. Especially since Jesus said, what I do greater things than these shall ye do in my name. Yo, it can't be just Pastor Maxwell who goes on the corner and prays. No, y'all, we got to do, if he does it, I can duplicate what he does. I ain't got to know all that he knows. All I know is this, if God could use him to help somebody else, he could use me to help them too. Throw your head back and shout, Lord, use me. Mm. Y'all, listen, if, if Jesus, if Jesus, if Jesus ain't here, if Jesus ain't here, if Jesus, if he ain't here, then we ought not be here either. <laughs> ah, God, I know y'all want to gather every Sunday morning to have church, but let me help you. If God ain't up in here, then y'all, we ought not be up in here. And if he's on the corner where the bar just let out or where the disco just turned out or where the club just shut down, that's where we need to be. I know you're saved and sanctified for the Holy but let the truth of the matter is, y'all, we ain't that saved. We remember from whence we've come. Therefore, we ought to go back to where Jesus is. Let me, let me go a little further. Uh, uh, if, if Jesus ain't here, if he's not here, then we ought not be here. 
<sighs> My God. Somebody at the celebration should have said, if Jesus isn't here celebrating, if he isn't here, if he's not here, then you know nothing is engaged. Nothing is engaged. If he's out there in the field work, I ought to be out there with him. Y'all, let me be real clear. I want to be clear. Jesus has nothing against celebration. I want to be real clear. He has nothing against celebrating. Go ahead and celebrate the goodness of God. Go ahead and worship. Dance. Ah, get your praise on. Sing. Shout. Run if you want to. Jump up and down. Because God has been good. But know that right over to the pool, right on over, make your way, shout your behind, dance your happy hips, right on over to the pool. With all that singing and praying you're doing in church, y'all take some of that to the pool. I mean, the way you jerking and gyrating, take it over to the pool and lay your hands there and go to jerking and gyrating and ask God to do something on his behalf. I know you've got energy to give God praise, but how much energy do you have for witnessing about him to other people? In this text, Jesus is not, he's not abandoning the celebration. Don't get me wrong, y'all. He's not abandoning the celebration. He's just trying to highlight mission work in the field. Y'all, I hope to energize you all as y'all prepare in celebrating 66 years of being in existence around what your mission is. Your mission has got to be foremost what y'all seeking to do. I already know Maxwell, that Maxwell is so in tune to God that whatever this church's mission is, is what God told us to do. Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them, teaching them, making disciples, y'all. God, God wants us to go outside of these walls and touch somebody. We got 46 days left. Before the, 40, before the end of the year. How many? 43. 43. 43, 43 days left. Y'all, y'all, if you got 43 days left, you, you got enough time to get 66 souls saved and bring them into the kingdom of God. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I hear you. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, you, you step over Negroes every Sunday morning to make your way to church. If you can step over them, you can bring them with you when you come so God can transform their lives. Let me see. How am I doing? Am I all right? Am I all right? Okay. Now, I might not get back, but while I'm here, I might as well do my thing. <laughs> Just in case I don't come back, it'll be all right. <laughs> I mean, y'all listen, the second thing the text teaches us, the second thing the text teaches us is that you really have to want to make a difference. <laughs> I just knocked on your door. I'm ringing that bell. You ain't got an answer, but I know you're home. The second thing the text teaches us is that you really have to want to make a difference. So God, is he's the object of the feast. He incites us to want to make a difference. I need you to see in this text the great length to which Jesus gets involved in this infirm man's life. He listens to the man's excuses patiently, lets him vince his frustration. Watch the text, y'all. He hears the man's expression of pain. He doesn't judge him for the way he feels. Jesus just stays focused on the assigned assignment. I want to suggest to you that I'm almost sure that there were probably a whole lot of easier cases at that pool. Jesus, however, chose a man that had been there for 38 years. I mean, y'all, this man had been there so long, he was confused about what he could do versus what he needed others to do. Y'all missed it. Watch verse 7. Jesus asked him in verse 6, do you want to be made whole? Watch what the man says in verse 7. Which proves, by the way, he's confused. I have no one to put me in the pool. Watch this. But while I'm coming, another jumps ahead of me. 
Y'all, the man been at the pool for so long that he's gotten confused about what he can do versus what he needs somebody else to do. <laughs> do you want to be made whole? I don't have anybody. Y'all missed it. I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. This is what I need. But while I'm coming, y'all missed it. Y'all, I mean, <laughs> he says, he says, but while I'm coming, y'all missed it. I'll do it again. He says, um, I have nobody to put me in the pool. But while I'm coming. Now listen, listen, either you can't do this on your own or you need somebody to help you. The man's been this way for so long until he's confused. He's been at the pool so long that he's confused about what he can do versus what he needs somebody else to do. Now, let me ask you, let me just ask. How are you going to be able to put yourself in the pool but use the excuse that the reason you haven't gotten in the pool is because you're waiting for someone to put you in the pool? So watch, watch what Jesus does. He challenges the man because while there have been a lot of easier cases that could have been eradicated by Jesus, y'all, Jesus chose a man whose sickness had become so cemented because a win may have been secured easier if Jesus had chose somebody else who hadn't been infirmed at the pool for such a long time. But Jesus wanted to make a difference so he walks right up to him and says, let's not deal with what you need others to do. I want to challenge you around what you can do for yourself. Oh! East friendship, I want to know something. Do you want to be made whole? Hmm. Jesus is absent. Obviously, y'all, not there just to be present. He's not there just to be present. He's obviously there to make a difference. And we know in fact that he does. I wonder though if the difference we make to the work that we have been assigned is related to the celebration we participate in. Let me confess, y'all. Y'all, I live stronger when my worship is better. Oh God. The celebration becomes critical because it helps to shape us to want to make a difference in people's lives. But the more I'm aware of the goodness of God, the more I want to extend his power to others who don't think things are good right now. You, know, you, 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 you can't make a difference at the celebration like you can in the field doing the work. It's a different purpose for gathering. The celebration has one object of focus and that's Christ. One purpose for being and that's worship. And one aim and outcome and that's glory. Now, I know I hurt somebody's feelings with this because you walked in here saying today, no, I want some attention. I want it to be on me. I want the focus to be on me. Well, that's what you get at the social club meeting. That's what you get at the support group. But when you come to God's house, he is the focus. He gets the attention. He gets the credit and all the glory. So style your hair however you want. Wear whatever name brand clothes you want. Spray whatever kind of perfume or cologne you want. If no one smells it, notices it, compliments on it, or give you any commendation, adulation, or encouragement, don't let that push you from the church because nobody ain't paying you attention anyhow. It's not, I ain't here to pay you attention. Because the truth of the matter is, we're not here to pay attention to you. This is the day the Lord has made, and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. If you knew my struggles, if you understood my problems, if you knew my pressures, if you knew what I was up against, if you understood why I can't afford to focus on you, but I, I got to focus on him. And since he can change my life, since he can change my circumstances, since he died for my sins, since he rose for my justification, I'm going to zero in on him. Because he's the one. He's the one. He's the one. If you can't find that stirring to make a difference, you don't, you're going to grow unhealthy on too high carb diet 
of celebration. You need some protein. God attaches to the protein the field work of which you have been assigned. God shows up in worship to amaze. He shows up in worship to astonish us. He shows up in our worship to anoint us. But then he sends us out to show off through you in the, in the field. He shows up in worship. He shows up off in the field. He shows up in worship and then shows off in the field. The problem, however, is the church has become so addicted to the Lord showing off in church that we don't let him show off in the field. I'm through. Thank y'all for letting me come. Y'all, I'm suggesting to you that y'all, we've got to learn how to let God use us out in the field. You've got to learn how to let God use us out in the field. Any Christian who understands Calvary knows that Jesus has showed off enough that y'all, that there can be no greater demonstration displayed of the power of God than what happened on the skull-shaped hill. Even if the sun refused to shine, even if the moon drips away in blood, even if the earth reels and rocks, none of these can compare to the demonstration of God getting his son up from the grave after he gave him up, got him up, y'all, so that we could get out of hell. So when we come to church, he shows up so you can go out here and show off. Let me help y'all. That's more than a hand clap. More than an occasional amen. That's really about giving God some unashamed praise. That's blessing God with all that's within you. And then once he shows off for us, he then sends us in the field and shows off through us to other people through signs and wonders and miracles. If no one is changing on your job, if no one is changing in your house, if no one is changing in your block, it's because you're not letting the Lord show off through you. Woo. He challenges the man. He challenges. Listen to the man. He challenges the man to take responsibility for his own life. Says to him, take your mat, take your mat and walk. Watch this. Y'all, take, take up your mat and walk because God has put the answer in you. And, and he, not in others around you, but what you need is in you. You don't need anybody, but God, all you need is God to grab the reins of your wholeness. In fact, the pool is, is not your holdup. A descending angel is not what's preventing you from being whole. It's your inability to take personal responsibility for your own wholeness. The moment you decide that you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, you can grab faith, take up your mat, and go to walking. Jesus tells the man, you didn't wait over at the feast for someone to bring you to me. I brought me to you in the field. And I'm offering an opportunity for you to walk from a place where you've been laying confined for 38 years. Take up your mat. Jesus offers what the celebration teaches that God is able to do. Jesus listens to the CERN where the man might need uh, uh, God in his life. He challenges the man to meet God at the place of real worship. He lets God deliver the man by not helping him to stand up when he's able to help himself to stand on his own two feet. Bible tells us that the man took up his mat. <laughs> oh, God. He took up his mat, threw it over his shoulder, walked away from the field. Man, the man took up his mat, threw it on his shoulder, walked away from the field. Now I'm going to ask y'all because y'all smarter than me. Where do you think the man went? How about this? Straight to the celebration. Can I tell y'all why? Because whenever God does something for you, in the field you have to come back 
to the celebration and give him praise for all he has done. Which is why nobody ought to have to stand up here in worship and beg you to give God glory. Because if you are still here, you survived another week in the field. And regardless of what happened in the field, scared, wounded, bleeding, you might be limping. But here's the good news. You're still here. Whatever may have happened to you in the field, you have survived. East Friendship, I'm talking to you today for 66 years. God has allowed you to survive. Praise God for surviving. Shouldn't shock you because y'all, the scripture teaches us that there are more, we are more than conquerors through Christ who gave himself for us. The Bible tells us oh God, that the man took up his mat, left the field, ran to the celebration. Right while in the celebration, somebody asked him, what are you doing up here carrying your mat? <laughs> the man replied, because a few minutes ago, that same mat was carrying me. But now, I'm carrying it. And I heard the voice of Jesus say, listen, y'all, whenever Jesus intervenes in the field of one's life, whenever he seeks to get involved in what's carrying you as a crutch, it'll start, you'll start carrying it and waving it in a way that you want to give God praise. What was carrying you was imprisoning you but now you are free from it. And since I'm here to tell you today, whatever God has freed you from, you ought to hold on to it so you can tell somebody else, this is why I praise God because God's been good to me and he's brought me a mighty long way. Lord, deliver me from stuck up people who keep trying to act like they ain't been nowhere, ain't done nothing. The devil is a liar because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God, God found a way to clean us up. I say he picked us up, turned us around, gave us a new lease on life. And since God's been good to you and brought you out, the least you could do is testify had it not been for the Lord on my side I don't know where I would be throw your head back and shout glory Excuse me, God formed us, sin deformed us, schools are supposed to inform us, prisons are supposed to reform us, but thanks be to God, Jesus transforms us, I'm so glad the Lord change me is there anybody else up in here today and you're glad about it God turns you around I said God turns you around could you help me a moment if you know it was God who turned you around just turn around it was God who made a way took me out of the muck and miry clay placed my feet on a solid rock to stand. Yes. Yes. I know. I've been changed. Because the angels. In heaven. That sign to me. Yes. 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 Yeah.
everyone to stand for a moment. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Listen, I, I tried to say this the best I knew how, but listen. listen. You. God didn't save you to keep what he saved you from to yourself. I know you don't want nobody to know. You don't want nobody to know of what you used to be and what you used to do. But let me help you. If God could save you, he could save your neighbor. You ain't the first one who ever had the idea to roll a blunt and smoke it. To the point where you almost lost your mind. You ain't the first who had a baby out of wedlock. Come on, y'all talk back to me. You're not the first who had an abortion and didn't tell nobody. You're not the first who had sex outside of marriage. You ain't the first who ever tried to commit suicide. You're not the first who ever drunk up enough liquor that you ought not even have a liver. You're not the first somebody who's hopped from hole to hole and bed to bed where you could have had AIDS and God kept you. Oh, I know, I know you saved now. Got nice shirts on. I'm on the ministerial staff. I'm one of the past. I know you're saved now, but baby, don't, don't, don't let that shirt fool you behind. Behind that shirt is a pass. And all he wants is for some real people to stop trying to be y'all a superficial save and all that. Just be real. Child, God save me brought me a mighty long way. You ain't the first one who ever sold drugs. I wish I was at home. I could say it like I really want to say it. See where I uh, back where I where I passed the y'all. I just go ahead and tell them you ain't the first one who gave up some to get some money to feed the children. I know y'all y'all too saved for that, but y'all that's real talk. And if God can bring you out of that, He didn't bring you out to keep it to yourself. Y'all them sixty six souls that we need up in here. Over the next 43, 43 uh, days, it can happen if just we would go back from the celebration to the commission work and do the work in the field. All right. Let's extend an invitation here today. Do the leadership come? Now, y'all line up. Y'all all right? Everybody good? Ministers, come on. I want, I want to do this. Now listen, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for three groups of persons. Please, nobody, no one else move but the leadership right now. Nobody else moves. I'm looking for three groups of persons. Please hear me carefully. I'm looking for the person who's never given their life to Christ. Never, never said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I want to be saved. Yes. I'm looking for the person who's never been baptized never given their hand to the preacher never joined the church I'm looking for the person who has never given their life to Christ you've never said Lord Jesus I'm a sinner 
I want to be saved. Listen to me carefully. If that's you, you in group number one. I want you to hold on to your number. Because in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to exchange that number for eternal life. All right. Don't make up your mind yet. Don't, don't, don't shake your head yet. Don't say no yet. Just wait a minute. If that's you, you're in group one. Never giving your life to Christ. Here's group two. Group two. Um, Pastor, I gave my life to Christ. I grew up in church. Got baptized. Gave my life to him. I joined church. Something happened though, Pastor. I can't really remember what happened. But something happened. Whatever it was that happened, it caused me to walk out and never come back. If that's you, you in group two, the Lord told me to give you this message. He told me to tell you, though you left him, he never left you. He's married to the backslide. So if that's you, you in group two, hold on to your number. Because in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to exchange it for restoration. Okay? Here's group three. Group three. Pastor, I'm saved. I'm being sanctified. But I'm looking for a church that will teach me the word of God. Make it practical to my life so I can live like he wants me to live. If that's you, you're in group three. Hold on to your number. Because in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to exchange it for membership. Now, let me just say that. I said, let me set the stage. Listen, don't pay these folk no mind. Because ain't none of these folk got a hell or heaven to put you in. None of them. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you might be. If you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ today, you can. Now listen, if you're here and you're in group one, group two, or group three, I don't care who you are. Don't care what you have on, where you come from. It doesn't matter. Don't care what you've done, what you're doing. doesn't matter. All that matters is what you do from this point on. If you're here in group one, two, or three, I want you right now, walk down this aisle. I'm waiting for you. Walk out from wherever you are. See, you're talking to me. You're talking to me. Come on. You're talking to me. I see you coming. I see you coming. I see you coming.